So we're back again, uh, learning more about persistence. Uh, so far we've taught you three methods to use persistence. Uh, one was with using the NS user defaults. Um, that was a very simple way to store small amounts of data. Um, you kind of are letting the system do it for you uh, with their built-in NS user default singleton. The second thing we showed you is we showed you how to use property list uh, to store data. Um, each of those is kind of limited in some way in that you can only store certain types of objects. You can only store um, like NS arrays, NS dictionaries, NS date, NS data, um, NS numbers, um, and a few other limited things. The option we're going to show you today is much more general um, to where you can have any object that implements NS coding um, can use the, uh, the NS coding techniques for persistence. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to use the tic-tac-toe example um, tic-tac-toe we had written a while back um, when we had it running. I do recommend that you go ahead and run uh, the version that I'm giving you here because I've made a couple changes to it uh, to do some of the busy work uh, to get it out of the way. The first thing you'll notice that I did, just to kind of warn you about it, is I went ahead and had it say application does not run in background. Um, so if you play tic-tac-toe and then you hit the home button, you can see that it actually stopped running um, and there is no persistence, right? So even though um, the iPhone has persistence, has multitasking, um, we're not using it here. Um, and the reason for this is really just so that you can see whether the persistence is happening or not. Um, it is a totally valid method. Oh, if you have some kind of weird glitch, um, you can just uh, reset your simulator. I um, should warn people about that. It happens whenever you have um, like apps that are kind of the same name but slightly different. Um, sometimes it gets confused, um, but it was easy to reset. Oh, also I should mention uh, if it says missing base SDK, to fix that again, uh, highlight the project, click on info, um, make sure the debug is your active configuration, um, and just change the best base SDK to the one that you're using. Um, so if you have that problem, you can fix it that way. Um, so you notice that it, each time you hit home, um, it closes the app, um, and then it uh, restarts from scratch. Oh, one thing I was surprised about is um, even though this app is not running in the background, um, I found that um, it actually, if you um, double tap, it actually shows up as though it is running in the background. Um, I think that's just for, for users so that it's like this is a record of not only the apps that are running but also of anything that was recently run um, but it's not running in the background you can see it shut down so what we want to do is we want to um, add persistence to this app um, so that whenever it closes and opens it'll actually save the state instead of starting fresh um, and we're going to implement it both for the iPhone and for the iPad version um, but the way we're going to do it is we're going to kind of get it for free uh, so let's do this. Let's uh, first look at uh, what I've done for you. Um, and the things I've done for you is I've gone ahead and I've made a load game and a save game method. Um, I've also gone ahead and I've made a uh, get a path uh, to an archive file. An archive file, you'll notice, um, does not have an extension. Um, just by default, there's, there's no extension on it. You could actually put one on if you like, but it does not need an extension. The other things I've done is if you look in view did load, um, you can see that I'm loading the game um, just before I update the game board. And then I'm also registering for the application will terminate notifications. Um, and we're going to get these because I've selected to not run in the background. So our application really will terminate. And sometimes this can be nice just because it provides a really clean, clear cut save point. Um, <clears throat> but you are, you know, throwing away all the advantages of multitasking. Um, Really, we're doing it this way so that we can uh, practice with persistence. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and start doing some stuff. So what we're going to do is in the save game is where we're going to start. Um, to save a game, what we're going to do is we're going to actually create uh, a data object. Uh, so I'll just call it data to save. Um, and it's going to be an NS mutable data. This is the first time that we've talked about uh, NS mutable data. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and release it down here whenever I'm done with it. The NS data class is a very uh, low level object. 
really what a NS data object is is it's just uh, it's just a, a byte buffer. Uh, so it's um, a buffer of bytes. Oops, not on the right one yet. Um, and it manages them. So you can get um, you can initialize it with bytes and you can give it a length. Um, you could also call a byte um, a uint eight, so an unsigned integer eight. Um, but really, it's just a byte. Um, and the main things you can do with it is you can get the length, um, so it does know its length, which is handy. Um, you can get the pointer to where the bytes are at, um, and you know there's a few other things you can do. And then if you want to be able to modify it, um, you need the NS mutable data, which means that you can, um, you know, append bytes and do other things. But it's really just it's just a buffer object. So what we're going to do is we're going to create when we save the game, we're going to create. Um, an NS data, and we're going to call the function on it uh, write file to or write to file, um, and we're going to write it to the uh, data file path atomically. Yes, I pretty much always use yes there. So this is um, <clears throat> polymorphism as, at its best. Um, this is the same function that we used with arrays. Um, and when we wrote those, those could write themselves to plist, um, but an NS data object um, will write itself out to a binary archive. Um, so this is where you're going to write things. It is also a return value that will return yes or no whether it worked. I usually just assume that it worked because this one tends to work just fine, um, but you probably should look at that if you wanted to be more official. Um, I'm just going to assume that it worked. So the format that we're doing here is like this. Uh, we're creating a mutable data, um, and then we're going to load the game object uh, into uh, the data to save. And then I'm going to store it off. So this is, this is what you're doing. In order to load a game object into the data to save, what we're going to do is we're going to make use of a class called um, NS uh, keyed archiver. I'll copy paste just so I don't make any mistakes. The idea of an of a keyed archiver is it's it's like a controller. It's going to help you put things into that data. That's its whole job. That's the only thing it does. Um, so it's going to um, convert objects into NS data. Um, so you can see the way it works is we're creating a new one. Um, and then in order for it to put stuff into that data, it's got to have a pointer to it. So right when you create it, um, you send a pointer to it. And you can see in the function name here, they remind you that that pointer better be to a mutable data object. Um, and so now we've created one. The way you use it is you have to decide what you're gonna, which object you're going to take. Um, and then you've got to have a key for that object so that you can reference it later. So you're going to take a key for it so you can reference it later and take that object um, and stuff them into the data. Um, and here we've made a key called uh, tic-tac-toe game key. Um, so we'll have to make a pound to find uh, for a tic-tac-toe game key. Um, you can see that it's just using a pound to find to make an NS string. And then the other thing you have to do is when you're done putting stuff into that data, you have to call this method called finish encoding um, that, that does stuff behind the scenes that you don't even really have to understand. Um, I don't really know what it does. I just know that when you're done loading it up, you say finish encoding, um, and then you write it to the file, um, and then to be a good memory management citizen, we should release it after the fact. Uh, so these are the steps for uh, saving data. Uh, pretty pretty simple. Uh, let's go look at loading data. Uh, if we attempt to load the data, uh, we basically just do the reverse. So if you look at the way the, the load function works here, as we're saying, if there's a file that exists at that path, then load from that file. If that if that path does not exist, then just create a new game. Um, so we're just creating a new tic-tac-toe game um, using our game model class. So if we do have something to load, um, what we're going to do is we're going to use that uh, archive um, to create a piece of NS data. 
Uh, the example here is exactly like what we did with NS arrays and plist. Um, you just say in it with contents of file, um, and it takes a binary file um, and it uses it to load up the data, which is great. Um, and then when after we're done with it, we'll release it. Um, and then what we have to do in the middle here is we have to load the game from the data. So we're basically unpackaging uh, the data. Whenever we put stuff in it, we used a keyed archiver uh, to take things out. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to use a keyed unarchiver. Um, so we want a key unarchiver. So an unarchiver needs to know the data that it's going to pull from. So when you create it, you in it with uh, for reading data. So we say where it's going to pull from. And then whenever you want to pull something out of that data, the unarchiver helps you. Um, and it helps you by, by saying decode object with this key. So you can see before we encoded the object for that key, now we're decoding it uh, for that key. So pull it out um, of the data. And then just like before, before you said finish encoding, here after you're done with it, you say finish decoding. Um, I really don't, it kind of makes sense what this one might do. I really don't know what this one does, but I just know that you're supposed to have it. Um, and then we are good memory management citizens, and we uh, and we release things. Um, so that's actually pretty straightforward, uh, but there's a catch. Uh, the catch is, in order to use um, encode object and decode object for a key, um, the class that you're calling it on, so in this case we're calling it on self.game, um, and you can see that self.game is of type tic-tac-toe game. The class that you're calling it on has to implement a protocol called NS coding. Um, you've, if you want to use these functions, you've got to implement this protocol. So what we're going to do is we're going to implement this protocol. Um, so first step is in the header we say that we're going to implement it. Um, and then in the implementation file, um, I'll just go down to the bottom here. Um, in the implementation file, I'm just going to make a new section uh, for my NS coding methods. Um, I also like to do this because now I can hold down command and double click on the word NS coding um, and it'll take me uh, magically to the protocol where it's defined. Um, it's defined within the NS object.h. Um, and I like to just copy them out of here, then hit the back button. Um, and then just paste them in uh, to right here. So if we want to use these methods, um, we are going to have to uh, implement um, encode with coder and init with coder. Let's start by writing the init one first. So an init method uh, looks like this. Um, it has a, a standard format. Um, for most initializers, oops, must have forgotten a bracket there, um, in that you start off by saying um, if self equals super init, um, so this is uh, calling super. Uh, one thing that's kind of annoying is if your super class is also um, implements NS coder, instead of calling this method, what you should actually call is you should call um, supers um, in it with coder and you know you pass along a decoder um, so if your super class implements NS coding you need to do this um, our super class in this case is NS object um, which does not um, implement NS coding so in this case uh, we need the top one uh, but I just wanted to tell you about this one in case you subclass something that already is NS coding uh, compliant um, and then what we need to do in here is we need to uh, use the decoder. Um, so sorry, use the uh, NS coder object um, to extract uh, the IVARs. Um, it doesn't have to be IVARs, but it usually is. So you need to extract um, the data that you want out of it. Um, so what we're going to have to get out of this is we're going to have to get the game state. Um, and then we're also going to have to get um, the game board. Um, and so to get the game state, it's pretty easy. Um, it's just a single enumerated type. Um, enumerated types are stored under the hood as integers. Um, 
So what we're going to do is we're going to use this coder to get the game state. Let's learn more about this coder by going to help. Um, the NS coder class, um, so whenever you, whenever you call a, um, the keyed archiver, it, it, it creates NS coder behind the scenes for you. The things that NS coder can do is you can use it to encode data, uh, which would be put data in, um, and you can also use it to decode data. So in this case, we're going to want to decode an int for a key. So this is a pretty, uh, pretty straightforward task. So we're going to take this uh, coder. So we're going to say self.gameState equals um, a decoder um, decode object for key. Um, and then we're going to need to make some kind of key um, to decode this thing. I'll just go steal it from the notes. Um, so I called mine, um, looks like game state key, pretty clever name I know. Oops. Uh, game state key. And then if we make a pound define like this, uh, we're also going to have to define it above. Uh, for no apparent reason this time, I chose to make it a string that wasn't the exact same as, as the pound define. That's totally legal. Um, you can make it whatever you want. Um, <clears throat> mainly, I just wanted to prove that you could. Um, so we're going to uh, decode that one. That one was easy. Uh, for the game board, um, it's actually a 3x3 three three array of numbers. So it's a lot easier to make a, a nested for loop. So we're going to go through each row, we're going to go through each column, um, and then we're going to load up into the game board uh, row dot column or row and column. Um, you'll notice that this one doesn't have a property, so I didn't uh, I didn't do anything with properties. I just loaded it up directly, uh, but I used the same function: a decoder decode int for key, and then I did something kind of clever here. Instead of having a pound define separate for each one, um, I just made the the key for each one be the word mark, um, and then what row it was, what column. So if you think about this, there's going to be a key called, um, you know, mark zero zero, mark zero one, mark zero two, mark one zero oh, one two, um, two zero two one and two two, um, and it's going to individually pull them all out. Um, so this is how I'm going to go about. Um, initializing an object when I'm passed in a decoder. Now in order for this to do anything useful you also have to encode the objects. So in this one we're going to encode uh, the game state uh, and we're also going to encode uh, the game board. I'll go ahead and just copy paste these. So we're going to encode using the coder I'm um, using encode for key. Um, and we're just going to encode um, oops. Uh, we're going to encode the game state um, saying encode int um, and we're going to pass it in the game state and we're going to use the same key that we used to unpackage it. And then when we encode the board um, we're going to do the same thing we did before. We're going to store each one um, and we're going to store it into this key. About the only thing about this that is confusing is <clears throat> over here we're calling methods like decode object for key. When you when you call decode object for key the the, the unarchiver is smart enough to create that NS coding object for you um, and then it calls um, in it with coder on your behalf. So it's kind of weird that this line right here is doing stuff behind the scenes and then it's calling this function right here. Um, so that's that's a weird little mismatch, um, but it's easy to figure out. Likewise, um, when you call this function right here, encode object for key, it creates the NS coder behind the scenes um, and then it calls this function um, encode with coder uh, behind the scenes for you. 
So it's kind of weird to have a function get called when you don't directly call it, um, but I assure you that is how it works. Oops, uh, looks like I called it data to save, and then here I just called it data. Um, and now if we run it, um, if we put some X's and O's on here, uh, we hit the home button, um, it goes away, app closed, we click on it again, and boom, it's right back. The nice thing about this solution is the um, the iPhone had multitasking, so it looked like it worked before, uh, but the iPad with 3.2 does not. Um, and the iPad, if we hit home, um, you can see it closed and it saved the state, um, and then you pop back and you're right where you were before. Um, and this is very important, um, right? So it's very important to be persistent um, with uh, any app that you write, should, should have perceived persistence. And you could, now that we live in an era of multitasking, you could implement your persistence by just hoping that the app never closes um, and just, just counting on multitasking to do the persistence for you. Um, obviously, with the way I said it, um, I am concerned that that solution may not work out for you um, if you start doing something important. I'll say that for a little app like Tic-Tac-Toe, um, to be honest, once persistence comes out for the iPad, um, I might just hope that multitask, multitasking um, does my persistence for me magically. Um, so once once it comes out, I might do simple things and just bank on multitasking. Um, but until um, <clears throat> until you start writing bigger apps, then once you write bigger apps, you're gonna you're gonna need persistence. Um, and this is a great way to do it. There are also a couple advantages of using this approach versus one of the other approaches. Uh, the first advantage of this is it scales very very well. Um, what you have to do is you have to encode a root object um, and then that object can in turn um, encode um, objects that are that it owns. And the way this works, if you can visualize a tree, is you call encode on all of your you know IVARs um, and if they're primitives then that's you know a leaf of the tree, you're done. Um, if it's another object um, then it's up to that object to know how to encode itself. So the only thing you ever have to do is you just have to take care of yourself um, and then that keeps trickling down until one of two things happens. Either you hit a primitive um, or you hit one of Apple's classes that already implement NS coding. Um, and there are a lot of classes that implement NS coding. Um, just to mention it, the UI view class, it implements NS coding. There's, there's a lot that do. Um, this actually means that, remember when we did that first example with the NS user defaults, there's actually an easier way to do that because you could have just encoded uh, the UI view, but we, we weren't worried about that. Um, so it's very common, which, which can be handy. The other thing I'll mention is that you can use it for more than saving. So if you think about this, there are two separate steps that were happening. Um, there was the um, you know, creating data, loading stuff into the data, and then in this particular app, we were writing this data to file, um, and that, that is something you might do with it. Um, another place where encoding is useful is for things like uh, GameKit. So the way GameKit communicates information is it passes NS data objects around. So one of the things that they recommend you do is that you create an object that you're going to pass, um, and then you um, archive it using NS coding, and then you can send it over the wire, so send it over the GameKit wire as an archived object. Um, then the other end gets it, um, and then once the other end receives it, they um, unpackage it. And so NS coding is really useful not just for saving stuff, um, but just for converting stuff into NS data. Um, this, this can be really useful if you get into GameKit. It's also really useful for making deep copies of objects. One of the problems that you run into in programming is if you make a copy of an object um, and that object has a bunch of pointers to other objects, all your copy does is it copies the top layer only, um, but then all the pointers point to all the same objects. Um, and that's a problem that comes up a lot in programming. And one of the best ways to fix it with Objective-C is just to write it out to data um, and then use that data cre to create the next object. Um, and 
presto changeo, you've got a you've got a deep copy of this thing um, with very little work. So it's really handy um, for making deep copies of things. There's also a few things you can do with images um, and storing things into their JPEG representation with compression. Um, not necessarily a great example there, but the top two are really good examples. Um, and <clears throat> the other important thing is that Apple is supporting NS coding too, right? Um, they've got a lot of their classes that support NS coding, um, and they make it really easy to work with. So this is the recommended way uh, to do persistence. Um, hopefully you've seen a really good example here uh, with the uh, model object. Um, the book recommends that anytime you make a model object, it should always implement uh, NS coding. It also recommends you implement NS copy, copying, uh, but we didn't do that here. Um, cool. So that's NS coding. Hope you enjoy it. See you next time.